Well, here we are once again. Hi, Bev. How are you doing? Hi, Brian. I'm really well, thank you. Goodness, what's this about uh, six, seven? I think we're seven. I think we're seven, on number seven. Yeah, really, really good to see you again. And um, the weather's getting a bit better, which is good. A bit warm weather. Um, yeah. I've had a haircut since the last time you saw me as well, which is Yeah, which me is really too. Good. First one in seven months. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> right, let's get cracking on this one if I can. Um, the last time I spoke to you, we'd been doing about composition and we'd done rule of thirds and I left you a few little new things to do. What was it I left you to do last time? Can you remember? Yeah, it was about converging parallels, looking for converging parallels. And I struggled. On? I really struggled. Um, I, I, I could see lots of sort of fences, but they were a bit boring. Uh, and I just really, I really struggled to find, to find any kind of scenes where they, they, they looked right. I, I've got a, a couple um, of a building that, that you can kind of tell me if I've got it right or not. Not necessarily right, but if I'm on the right track for what it was you were asking. Although I did drive down to Kent. As we came out of lockdown, we went to see my mother-in-law down in Kent. And as I went across the, the Queen Elizabeth bridge um, from Dartford into Kent there was the perfect opportunity and I think I saw exactly That's the what big you sort of suspension bridge isn't it, it? Because is, yeah. north of the Thames yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's you've true. got the Dartford tunnel coming north and the bridge takes you south and as we came onto the bridge uh, we were in the sort of the middle lane of the road going onto the bridge and there was this perfect sort of the bridge was very straight it actually goes over a, a bit of a bump but mm. and that added to it so you had the rise of the bridge and the the lines of the road sort of coming together and then you had all of these uprights that were sort of coming up like this and it would have been a perfect shot if we weren't doing 40 miles an hour in the middle of a four lane road uh, and I hadn't got my camera so <laughs> yeah, they get a bit upset when you stop the car in the middle of the road I think they might think, have done yeah, yeah mm. I think they might have done no fun um <laughs> death by photo you know don't want to die taking a photograph on a bridge so so other than that I just really struggled but I, I've got a couple that you could have a look at and kind of let's go on let's have a look okay we well the, here, here's my second challenge we're talking today uh for the the main part of today about post-production aren't we mm. uh, so I've uploaded these into Lightroom but I don't actually know how to do anything with them so I managed to figure out how to upload them because I didn't want to it, it took quite a while so I didn't want to waste this video uploading them um, do I have share rights you yes, should have yes so hopefully you can see the the album that I've You're got in Lightroom right, so yes I'll have a look on my second screen okay so I've got them in um raw and also in jpeg so if I open the JPEG, it'll be a little bit easier to see until you do any post-production. So yes. how do I make this bigger? Do I just click on it? Just try clicking on it. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with the screen you've got there. So um, Ah, no, you haven't actually added the photos yet, have you? Have I not? No, it says to add the photos. See, these oh, are on the camera. Oh, okay. So this could take a little while then. It could take a little while. Well, I'll tell you what, you add the photos. I thought I'd done that because they were showing. Can we see that happening? There's quite a lot of them. I uploaded the whole album, so there's about 170 photographs, I think. Oh, it's not, it's t it's going quite quickly. Why are they all upside down, though? Good question. I'm not totally familiar on that, but some of them are writing themselves now. Okay, so um, how are we doing? Okay, if you got those, a slider, right? Yeah. Ah, here we go. Okay. And we should just build it to, if you go down to the bottom left, it should be to your right a little bit. There's sort of touch more. There's like a big rectangle. A rect that's it. Try clicking on that. Uh, okay. Let okay. me just go back and see if I can see the photograph that I want to share first, though. Um, I think it was this one. So, yeah, I sort of had all of the, all of the lines were vertical on the, the cathedral. This is Peterborough Cathedral, by the way. So I took it from a distance to see if I could get the, the 
cathedral i don't know that people can see my hands anymore they can probably only see the screen um i don't know tell me what you think well you're taking it from a distance which in itself um changes the perspective of it so when we're about convergent parallels we get distortions um, the convergent parallels are usually a distortion because we're seeing perspective. Something is further away than another part of it. And when we are near a building, we're usually closer to the bottom of the building than we are the top, for instance. So what happens is the top appears to co converge together. It becomes closer. The top parts become closer to each other. And that is a distortion, a type of distortion in itself. Now, as we get further away, and using a longer lens, that stops some of the distortion. So we tend to get the verticals more vertical, um, and the whole thing comes into a better perspective. If we can go to a, a, an earlier photo than that. How do, how do I move between them? Just click to the middle one. The, the, you see the little, that's it. Click on that. And if you go to the photo before it, that's it. Just click on that one. And again, go to the full screen. Now we're a little bit closer to that and we can see that the top is starting to close in. It's starting to get a little bit more close at the top than the bottom. Mm -hmm. If you were to go really close into that and take with a wider angle lens, you would find that it would really start to close in at the top. It would be very, very close and you get the convergence of the parallels. Imagine if you look, if you can, imagine looking down a road and as you're standing looking down the road in the distance, as you look to the, the very far distance, the road almost looks as if it comes to a point. Mm. Whereas at where you are, it's the full width. Let me show um, you something else as well before we move on, because this might give a better image. Ah, that's great. Image. Yeah. So that was looking up, up at, at the frontage of the cathedral. There was sort of, um, the, there was an um, alcove type yeah piece bits on the front so i literally stood at the bottom and it's it's not a particularly good it's a horrible photograph but i hoped it might show the lines well if you think about the the fact that the the top of those arches are actually the same distance as the bottom of the arches apart however on the photograph because of that convergence of the parallels because of that distortion it distorts the view to make them look closer together and if you want to do accurate um, photographs of buildings, that distortion is something you don't necessarily want. So we need to be able to get around it. And one of it is one way, if you um, can imagine, the camera is actually looking upwards there. So the camera is not horizontal, it's pointing um, at upwards at probably about a, a 50, 60 degrees angle. And that causes more distortion. So to get a good view of a, of a, a building, you really want it to be um, straight on, horizontal. Um, but that gives a nice accurate rendition, but it doesn't necessarily give you an artistic rendition. And this would be what I would consider a, a, an artistic shot, but it's certainly not an accurate record um, of the building. But would this be, if you were to bring the camera down to where it was, you wouldn't see any of the top part of it. So there are various ways to go around this. Some of the ways that you could do it is take it from a much greater distance and use a telephoto lens. And a telephoto lens from a greater distance is going to stop some of that um, convergence to the parallels. But there again, how far away do you get? If you've got a whole crowd of people in the way, then you're not going to get the photograph. If that's um, that's fairly well sheltered in, so you'd lose an awful lot of that detail. So again, like everything else in photography, it's all a compromise. But that compromise can be appealing. There's one top left. You just, you just moved up there. There they are. The extreme top left there. That's very much an abstract shot, um, but the, the use of the convergent parallels makes it quite an artistic shot. And that to me is appealing. That's the sort of thing that which appeals to my sort of, to my eye and my style. Um, but as a, an accurate record, not, not terrific. Mm. Artistic record, really good. So it depends on what you're trying to get from your photography. And um, again, like was said about the idea of um, rule of thirds, when we're saying about um, using out of focus backgrounds to give the separation, all of these things work towards giving you the image that you want. And the, the, the beauty of the rules, I think I've said it before, there's a great thing on this, that rules are the obedience of fools and the guidance of the wise. So, you know, by using those rules, 
great one there about reflection. Wonderful. Oh, but that that was there. the parallels that I was thinking there was as it as you look through the arch of the bridge and the reflection, it, the 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 river disappears into the distance. It sort of goes together. So. Absolutely. But you've then got other things coming into it. You've then got the fact that you've got a, a really good reflection in the water there. So that's another that's another form of um, artistic uh, expression on that. And again, if you didn't have that reflection on there, that would be something of a little bit of a boring photograph. The reflection actually makes it work. And as you say, the fact that you've got the, those converging parallels of the light disappearing, it's actually the, it's actually the, the, the reflection of the trees as much as anything mm. on the river behind, yeah. which is causing that. Interesting shot. I, that, if you didn't have that, you didn't have the reflections and you didn't have that sort of converging parallel, it would be a, a boring shot of a, a nice bridge. So by utilizing those and, and using your eye just to pull out those bits and pieces, really to me makes the difference between a good and a poor photograph. That's not a bad photograph at all. That um, you know, um, there's some great things you can do. But this is where I'm saying about the composition. Composition of photographs to me is the be all and end all of what we do as a photographer. We've we, we talked about exposure triangles we've talked about depth of field all of those things are important but they're the tools you know we don't say wow that house has got fantastic mortar but the house is dependent upon a upon the bricks having mortar between them to hold them together we you know it but we we look and say that's a fantastic house and it, it to me photography is about the composition and the tools which we use to create that composition are the elements of the aperture the speed the whatever it is um but that composition doesn't is what comes from the eye and it's what's pleasing on the eye so i think that's that's great and you know you said that you didn't really have much of an opportunity to do it i think that's an ideal opportunity to show what <laughs> conversion parallels are superb what, what's really interesting if anybody has watched any of the earlier ones in the series we, we i can't remember which one it was but we talked about mo how moving just a foot or two one way or the other changes the whole um picture and if i just show you i took this it had quite a few different in quite a few different places um, but didn't get the same effect. So that that's not so different, but it's it, it's totally wrong. It doesn't work for me at all. It's it, yes, you've still got this bit here with through the bridge. But a huge but, mess on the left. But there's a whole mess here. Um, and then this one is it's it's all out of balance. I, I think the one I showed you before probably adheres to the rule of thirds a little bit more. Um, and I just kept moving slightly along the way and getting, again, too much in the forefront. And then finally, I kind of got to this one, which is the one I thought that wo that works for me. And I think I, I may not have known that if I hadn't have taken a few at different positions. Well, exactly. And the, the, the beauty of this is it's not now me telling you that it's you looking at it and think well i'll move it, it's the, the the important thing of this and it, it's like any learning experience it's what you do with the knowledge that you've got and the fact is it's you now using that knowledge i could stand here all day and and tell you all sorts of things to do but because you've actually decided to do those things and you've used that next time you come across something like this in the future this it'll stick in and that's the idea and that's what i hope anybody watching these videos gets that go out try it we, we've discussed this before. Digital cameras have got a wonderful thing which film cameras didn't have, which is almost limitless uh, amounts of photographs to be taken. Um, you're not limited by 24 or 36 exposures before you get to get a film processed. You can take a thousand photographs. And so you even you take see, a spare battery. <laughs> oh, as soon as you take a spare battery, yes. <laughs> um, but this, this is the beauty of it. And with the modern techniques, you can instantly see on your screen on the back of the camera, you can instantly see um, what the results are and think, well, no, that's not so good. This is good and whatever. Yeah, let's let's look at this one. So this one, it, I was at Beaver Castle, spelt Belvoir Castle in Lincolnshire, mm. which catches everybody out. Um, and this was just a, a bit of uh, gateway fencing, whatever you might call it, that I thought was quite interesting. It's not a good shot of it, it's very messy, but 
again, I, I think I said at the beginning, I was struggling to find, I thought I was struggling to find converging parallels, um, but this was one that I thought, well, that probably is going to converge if I take it at an angle. So I was stood sort of, I was probably stood adjacent. Is that the right word? 90 never, degrees, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, so at 90 degrees to the fence taking the photograph, probably not 90 actually, probably 45 degrees actually yeah. looking down it. Um, but it, I get, now I look at it again, I realize that it gives, it, it gives me the feeling that if I, that eventually that fence would come to a little point, it would just kind of. Just as I said about the road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, the other thing is, <clears throat> the other thing is as well, looking at that, if you had been, you know, straight onto it, so you were 90 degrees that fence and taking a shot, it'd be a really rather boring shot. It's a pretty boring shot now. <laughs> yeah, and but that's an interesting thing in itself insofar as not every shot you're going to take is going to jump out and have all these fantastic things. The last one you did, the bridge, I was really impressed with because it, it, it did inspire something. But remember that some people are professional photographers. They're getting paid to take a photograph of something for a purpose, whatever it is. And we always assume that that's the real reason to take photographs. It's not. I've said before, to me, photography is about storytelling. And it could be, and I'll, I'm going to cover this in a few moments, actually. There's a, there's a great shot in this, but the story is what's pertinent to you as a photographer. And the image is used to tell that story to somebody else. And to be honest, even what could be considered to be a boring subject is what could provoke the image. We we take photographs on holidays. We take photographs of families. You know, we, we'll take a photograph of, of a child or a grandchild or something like that in the most mundane of circumstances, sitting in the sitting room that you're used to seeing every day of the year. But this is what the memory from in 10 years time is important. And if you can spice it up a little bit to make it stand out more then great. It may be that this visit to the castle is a particular memory that you want that it, you know, ignore the fact that we said about convergent parallels. It could be that this is something you want to remember in years to come. If you're taking your daughter, or your granddaughter across to somewhere like that, and this is the photograph that you want to show, why have a boring one? If you can take what's a bit of a mundane subject, as you said, it's not the most boring, interesting subject, but it's a memory, it's a story. Yeah. And now by putting a little bit of a slant onto it, by taking it up at a more oblique angle rather than the, the 90 degrees, you've now made that have that little bit of extra zing. So in 10 years time, you look back with a more of a smile on your face and you remember the story of it. Well, I will. the story of that will be, that was my brother telling me I had to go and find some converging parallels and that was the best I could manage. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I mean though. Let's have the next one. That's good. Oh gosh, right. Are we still going through mine? Uh, what else? Have Let's have one more. I don't know if you want to kind of pick one as we're going because I was just playing around. I can't think of any more converging. Well, let's parallels. go to one of those tractors, actually. Let's go to the, the right hand of the tractors. This one? Oh, that's the left hand, this one. Yeah, you're the right. Yeah, the right. Nice Fordson Major tractor. That shows how, how sad I am that I know about it's a Fordson Major. I've driven plenty of those in the past. Um, yeah, can you remember what I said about the side on view? It's a bit boring. It is a bit boring. It is. Now, if you'd gone, say, three or four feet to your left and had it more of a uh, more of an angle, that would have taken off. So we're, oh, we're I'm going to tell you a story then. Can you see this little shadow? Yes. This was a girl and her dog Stop sat at there. the side of the thing, of uh, uh, the, the tractor. But if I keep going down a little bit later on, she'd gone... And there we are. And I and took it same in a tractor. Slight, yeah. And I think it proves the point. A little bit more interest. And now you've actually got some converging parallels because although they don't appear to be converging parallels, the body of the tractor is actually getting narrow as it goes to the back. You've got some form. And what that what that does for this shot is it gives a little bit of more character to the actual subject. It becomes less flat. You've got a more of a th more of a three dimensional view to it. So again, you've actually preempted what I was what I was thinking on it, but it it, it it reinforces what I've basically just said to you. 
And the important thing of that is it's you thinking of that. It's you going out there in the first place thinking of it. Now, whether you're using an iPhone, which is what the discussion when we first started this series was, whether you're doing it in an iPhone or a camera, makes a little difference. The difference is probably that you're more conscious because you have a camera with you, which is something you suggested in the early days. But the actual composition of the photograph, whether it's an iPhone, um, a, a micro four thirds camera as you got, a, a full frame camera, or even a large format camera, medium to large format camera, it doesn't really make much difference. The important thing is you're taking an image with it and you're telling the story. And to, that, to me, that conveys a different story to the, the flat side on view. So yeah, superb. We touched Shall on the Lightroom there. Shall I stop sharing for a moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably a good idea. Because what I'm going to suggest doing is we touched on the Lightroom and we touched on to this last time. And I thought it was a good thing to do is to have a quick look at Lightroom and to have a quick look at what we can do. Now, you've got Lightroom. I use, I use Lightroom uh, all the time. But it, really what we're saying is anything which is an image manipulation tool, whether it be Photoshop, whether it be the cheap software, which is given free with your camera, because some of those are superb. We need to look at post-production. And the reason we need to look at post-production is it can actually do a huge amount to change the photograph that you're doing. There's good and bad on post-production. Some people say that everything should be done in the camera and it's, you know, it's totally purist. I don't go for that. I, again, I go for the idea of telling a story. And yes, if you're a professional photographer, you should be getting really good shots out of the, the camera on almost every shot. But even professionals fail sometimes. Even professionals, there's so much you can change on a camera these days that, and you've got pressure on, that professionals will fall back on it. Especially if you've got a client who's paying and you've got one chance to do it. If you're taking a photograph of a wedding, for instance, and you've got a bad setting on the wedding, poof, you know, you can't go back to the bride a fortnight later and say, can we do that again? So the idea of post-production to me is really important. And I'm going to share my screen now. Now, I brought up a few things in Lightroom and what I've done, you're going to hate me for this. I've taken some of your photographs from the very first session that you did. Um, I found them, I found them on the share and I thought, do you know what? I'm going to play with some of these a little bit because they're an interesting thing. It's probably more pertinent to do these ones because you made more mistakes on these than the later ones. And Lightroom can be adapted. Why we're talking about Lightroom, I, I love Lightroom. I think it's a, a great program, but it's actually a database. It's not necessarily an image manipulation program. It's a great cataloging tool. So I use Lightroom. All my photographs go into Lightroom and it catalogs where they are. But the beauty of it is it's a non-destructive um, system. So in other words, what happens is it uses part of Photoshop. It's an, it's an Adobe product. We're not being sponsored by Adobe. You know, we're both paying for this. Um, but I find a really good piece of uh, piece of equipment. And for me, it allows me to catalog all my photographs and I have thousands, so it keeps them in a reasonable uh, manner. Uh, but also it's a non-destructive change. And it, what it does is it, it keeps a catalog, as it calls it, um, of instructions. So where we can see two photographs there, the left-hand one is the original one. And these are raw files. And I'll come to that in a second, the difference between raw and JPEG, but these are raw files. But what it does is it, it tells, when you start Lightroom up and you click on this photograph, it applies some changes to the image, but it doesn't permanently write them to the image. It keeps a database of what you had this set to, what you had that set to, and it changes it all that way. And to actually get a changed image out of this, you export it as a JPEG. So can I, can I ask a very quick question? Hmm. And, and, I, and my apologies if this is a bit of a silly question. There's Lightroom and there's Photoshop. Yeah. Why do you need both? Do you need both? What's the difference? Can, are you able to do that in just a few minutes or is that a, a, a sort of session in its own right? Very simple. Photoshop is an, a total image manipulation tool. Um, it's very, very um, extensive. It's got so much in it you wouldn't believe. And it is there for taking an image and applying changes to it, whether putting text onto it, whether changing exposure or contrast or color balance or whatever it is you want to do. And there are hundreds and thousands of different things that you can do on there. Um, and then to write that image as a new file. 
Lightroom is more photography oriented insofar as its primary reason of, of existence is a catalog program. It catalogs, it stores your photographs, or it looks where your photographs are stored on, the, on your hard disk, and it keeps them into folders or into catalogs themselves so you can group them together. But it takes a subset, a small amount of the tools that Photoshop has and allows you to manipulate your photographs with them. And as I say, it's non-destructive. So it's basically saying, let's see what would happen if we change the exposure by this much. We like that. So next time we open it up, we'll automatically add that to the image that we see. And we'll only actually apply those fully when we export it to a new, pro to a new photograph. So Photoshop, part of the, the, the photo photography package of um, from Adobe, Photoshop basically will do shedfuls more of the manipulation, but doesn't do any of the cataloging as such. And you can actually send a photograph from Lightroom to Photoshop to be adjusted on there and brought back in again. So if you really want to do something fancy, you can do that. But for me, the majority of what I do in Lightroom is enough to get my photographs usable. We'll see as we go on. But think of it as a nice, easy way of keeping your photographs usable, keeping them where you can find them and doing the standard changes. OK, let me just re um, recap on what you just said. So you said an image in Photoshop. Is the difference here as well that you can manipulate bulk photographs in Lightroom? So say everything, you, you'd, you'd overexposed everything and they'll actually, I want all of them to be slightly less exposed you can do it on mass you certainly can if i was to look in the um in the photographs if i click on that photograph for instance there's a certain granddaughter uh, granddaughter of yours mm -hmm. uh, and i go into library shall i say we have a look at that we can um sync the settings on there i'm not going to do it at the moment i, I can't mm. do but you can sync the settings or sync metadata and, and basically what that does if i have a white balance and for instance or as you say if it's overexposed and i know that it's two stops overexposed i can click on one highlight the rest so if i click on that first one which i want to click on first it takes those details highlight some more i can go into my sync settings there and i kind of tell it which things i want to actually apply across the rest of the highlighted ones. So if I brought my first exposure down by two stops and then I told it that I wanted to, um, oh, where, where are we? Uh, do you know, I can't see wherever it is. There we are, exposure, basic tone. I could click exposure and unclick the rest and it'll just do whatever I've done as an exposure change on that one to the rest. Now, when I was doing a lot of school photography, if you, if you suddenly got to a point where you realised that you'd actually underexposed the whole lot and you had 1,200 um, photographs, it's a great way of, of applying them. Get one to its right, apply it to the other 1,199 of them, and suddenly you've got, the, got them back in the ballpark. And you can do that with white balance, exposure, contrast, whatever it is. Yeah. But let's have a look at some of these photographs on here. Now, if I... Go to the develop mode. Where did, oh, okay, yeah. What I've done is I've done on the bottom left, I've got a, a cycle between before and after, and I can do various sort of things on this. But if I have a look at those two photographs, raw versus JPEG is one of the questions. I like shooting in raw. JPEG has a compression on it. It makes the files much smaller, but also the camera will do a certain amount of manipulation inside to make the image good. A raw image is literally that. It is raw. It's exactly what you get from the lens. It's big um, and it's got all the data there because JPEGs are a lossy um, compression. They will get rid of what they don't need. But with raw, it allows an awful lot of the data, anything which hits the sensor is recorded. Now, the trouble is we like a little bit of manipulation on the on the images. So JPEGs usually look really good because the camera software is very, very good at, at sorting it out. But what RAW does, it gives you latitude. It gives you the ability to actually get into some of the shadows and get into some of the hidden information, which you may not immediately see. And we'll see this as we go through some of these photos. So if you have a look at the photo on the left-hand side, it's a, a photograph. As I say, these were photos taken by you 
on our very first lesson. So, you know, these were before we'd had a lesson, actually. Fact, these are the ones that I did lesson, yeah. before I'd ever had a lesson. <laughs> And it shows. One, and one of the problems with with um, raw images is they t can tend to look very flat. And if you look at the one on the left hand side, it's it's fair enough. It's an image. It doesn't look particularly. It doesn't have any pizzazz about it, really. But if you have a look at the image on the right hand side, and then we'll look down the extreme right, we can see what's been done on this. So what I've done is I've altered the highlights a little bit, and by hitting these sliders, by moving these sliders backwards and forwards we can see that it's altering the image. I can see that we've got in the shadows there. The shadows brings out the dark areas and it will boost just the dark areas. And if you look at the top right where the cursor is, we have got what's called a histogram. And there we have our blacks and there we have our whites. And when we go totally to this side, we can't go any further. It's as black as we can get. When we go this side, it's totally washed out and white we can get, as white as we can get. Sky tends to be up there. And when we're starting to lose cloud definition, for instance, on sky, it's because it's usually up this top bit. And when we've got too much shadow, it's down in that bottom bit. So by altering the shadows, I can start pulling out some of the bits. If you look at the back wheel, for instance, the brickwork at the back wheel, you can see that I can see more detail on the back wheel and pull the shadows out slightly. So we can do all sorts of things. We can change the color balance. So the white balance, because of course we perceive whites in different ways. We, we actually take account, our eyes take account of what the natural light is and the temperature of the light changes as the day goes on. We get what's called the golden hour at the very beginning of the morning and the end of the evening. That's because we get a very orangey, ambery red light. Um, lunchtime tends to be a very blue white light, very harsh. So we can actually change the color balance by, say, hitting, finding out something which is white and it samples it and tries to make that white a correct white for the rest of it. If I hit the color balance onto something purple, for instance, Ooh. that thinks that this is actually white. So it's adjusted the rest of it to there, which it obviously isn't. So we can actually, if we've got something in there which isn't quite right, we can hit white balance and we can actually change it between that amber and the blue. So we've got the ability to actually make our whites white again and get rid of color casts. So what we've done on this is we've managed to take what's a bit of a, a flat photograph and make it a little bit more pizzazz. Great. Is that a bad photograph? Have we cheated? Well, actually, no, because everything that's on there is in that photograph on the left hand side. All the, that total image is in the photograph on the left. We haven't added to it. We haven't sub subtracted to it. All we've done is basically play around with the color balance and the light. And that's all there. Is it cheating? Well, I don't think so, because in actual fact, what we're doing is we're making a correction for what the camera is saying as a best guess for the middle. It's best guessed what the white balance is. I wouldn't is. say it's cheating. I'd say it's enhanced. It's a bit like going from not wearing makeup to wearing makeup, isn't it? It's not, well, you're thing, not changing the face, you're just enhancing. Well, the it? difference with makeup is you're adding something to it. What we're doing here is actually not adding to it at all. This is all information which is already there. It's, it's almost like saying that we're going to enhance the natural skin tone in some way, but you're only using skin tone. So we've got the ability, and we're just crafting the light somewhat. Where does is this there a right or wrong to this, or is it just you play around until you get something that you think feels and looks nice? Um, there are some people who will say that, oh, there's a correct way to do this and an incorrect way to do this. Do you know what? It comes back to what I said before. Does your, story, does your photo convey the story you wanted to convey? Um. Again, if you're doing a scientific record photograph, if you're recording something which is going to be used as a scientific record, you want it to be exact. Let's have a look at this one. We've got a tree stump. You know, we've got some leaves underneath it. Is it better on the right or is it better on the left? I think it's nicer on the right. I think so as well. There's a little bit more texture. The leaves tend to stand out a little bit. You know, there's a little bit more detail in the water. But is it right? Well, that's up to the, the person who's made the photograph. And 
for me personally, I tend to like that sort of look a little bit more where you've got the detail coming out and it, it stands out a bit more. So right and wrong, I think, again, you're the storyteller. You're the one with the camera. You're the one who's got the controls on this. What this is allowing you to do is to actually make something which is able to be conveyed over. Now, go back to that thing. If you were a professional photographer and you're taking the bride's photo and it's not quite right, is she going to want a photo which is not quite right? Or is she wanting something which is going to be pleasing to both the photographer and her? Mm. Mm. I'd rather go for the latter rather yeah. than the scientifically correct one. And I've noticed on that you've really lifted the reflection, the light hitting the water. Well, yes. there's a few things on this. And what I've what I've done on it is there's a, a couple of wonderful little controls which can be overused. I tend to overuse them because I find them from an artistic point of view. The texture, the clarity and the dehaze, de de I think are wonderful. And the clarity, I love using the clarity control. And putting a little bit of clarity on. Now, this one, I deliberately took it way up to maximum. And it really has sharpened that up. Mm. But it's made it actually incorrect. You know, it, it's a little bit too much. And some people overdo this. I, I personally like a little bit of clarity on. But again, let's take it fully down. Is that a bad shot? It's a very artistic shot. Is it accurate? Not in the least bit. We haven't seen it like that. But it's actually quite, a, quite an arty sort of shot. Personally, I prefer it brighter. Than I like that. that. I like that better. Yeah. But yeah. this is, again, it's your story to tell as a photographer. It's your image. And if somebody says, well, that's wrong, why is it wrong? It's a bit like saying somebody's opinion is wrong, isn't it? You can't Absolutely. have a wrong opinion. It's somebody's opinion. Absolutely. What I'm trying to show you on this, though, is that you can take a photograph and you can manipulate it very, very easily on this. I can start playing around the highlights and you can see that it's changed that photograph totally on that. And can you see the histogram at the top, on the top right hand side, that graph at the right hand side? As I move that up, you can see how the light level at the, at the right hand side increases and it's, it's pretty much burned out there. So we've lost all this detail here, it's just become too bright. If you see the detail around there, it's gone. So by pulling that down, we can get it back. Now, Lightroom is actually really good because there's a little auto button. And what I tend to do is I hit the auto button first of all. And the auto button is really good for giving me a good starting level. Now, you know, you can say, well, that's cheating because there, but isn't that what a camera is doing when you're using one of the, one of the presets in the camera? You're using its auto button to give you the JPEG. Do you know, so, I, I can't get my head around this cheating thing because we're, we're on Zoom talking to one another from opposite ends of the country so surely we're cheating if that by that theory by that logic we shouldn't be doing this we should be ignoring technology and being in being face to face with each other but that would mean we'd have to walk because otherwise we'd have to get in a car or a train or some Absolutely. other kind of technology so i think the idea of cheating because you're using technology is is kind of moot it is, but it's a great discussion on on um, on the social media at the moment as to what's cheating. Personally, I, as I say, I go back to the idea: is it conveying the story and the image that you, as a photographer, would like it to convey? That's the thing for me. Let's go through a couple of these. I'm not going to spend too much time. Oh, right. Oh, that was a bit of a problem. There's a oh, totally wow. unusable photo. That's one. How do you get around a photo like that? How many of those photographs have you taken where you thought, oh, you've got that wrong? <laughs> loads, you? loads of well, the early yours. days. The photo on the right is the same photo. And what I said about RAW, because that's an, an ORF file, that's a, an Olympus RAW file, the detail is all there. That, what you can see on the right-hand side, everything on the right-hand side is in the left-hand photo. And what I've done on that is literally hit the auto button and I've started messing around with it. I haven't even touched texture cloudy or dehaze on there. The problem that you get on that, if I zoom in, you're getting a lot of noise because it was so badly exposed. We can mm. see a whole lot of the digital noise. Um, but if that's the only image you're going to get to recollect that, that area, if that's the, the, the one that you need, if that's the, the killer shot, you've got it. So by using this, look at the latitude you have in so far as using a RAW file, which is why I, I usually do shoot in RAW, or if I shoot, I shoot in RAW plus JPEG, but I always almost have the, the RAW file. But 
again, coming back to the idea, if you're doing someone's wedding and you'd accidentally knock the exposure down and that was the one chance you got, you might save the day. I and this quite is, like that photograph now. I can see it. The colours are lovely. not bad, is it? Yeah. But on the left-hand side, that's what you had originally. Wow. So the next one got the anchor there and the same on the right-hand side. Oh. Now you can see that there's not the much detail across. on the wall. Sorry? The detail on the grazed plasterwork on the wall. Oh, yeah. But look at the plant work. You can't see the plant work. It's deep in the shadows. Oh, yeah. But you suddenly brought that out and made what was a throwaway shot very usable. And again, it's telling oh, that even story. the colours in the front of the green, the greenery in the front bottom, bottom right hand corner has really lifted the reds in there, hasn't it? It has. And that information is all there. Again, I've put the clarity up a little bit. The shadows are really brought up because that's how you're getting these dark parts out. Can you um, can you lift just certain areas? You can. So if I was, for instance, to want to put this back into shadow, for instance, by going up to the right hand side, the adjustment brush. That gives me the ability to do things. So if I bring the exposure down on that one and the contrast down and the shadows down, I say, I'm having a guess, best guess at this. You'll see there's a big, there's a move it across as a big circle there. Well, it's two circles because it's it, what it'll do is it'll do a certain amount of, of exact, but there's a, a, an area where it'll phase it out, phase it out, if mm. you like. And if I just do this across to there, the red bit shows where I'm actually hitting on this. Oh, yeah. So instantly I've managed to, to darken that back. Oh, well, actually worse than it was. And once I've done this, I can actually say, well, actually, that's too much. So let's let's lighten it up just a touch on there. So if you had something, if that was just too bright, that green, and it was taking the eye away, I could do that. So I've now got that green. There's a bit of detail in this, a bit of red, but it's not as bright as it was. Mm. If I go back to what it was beforehand. So you've got a lot of things that you can play with. And on this you got almost all those controls. So you could add texture, you can change the contrast to one little bit. You can change the size of that circle. How are you doing that? Just with the wheel? I'm just using mouse? the wheel on my mouse, but you can actually do it with controls as well. But um, there is, if I slide it down to there, the brush size and the feathering. So I can change the size on there. It's really, really adaptable. So you can either use, I'm, I'm pointing at the screen like people can see. So be, below the histogram, you've got a sort of a, a bit of a menu there. Is that the same as you've got expanded lower down? So you you use that that slider there. And then yeah, I use that slider. What we have here, there's a few tools. Let's, let's go on to this photograph as it is. I'll go back to that as a full size shot. If we go up to here, I find on Lightroom, a really good way on Lightroom is to start from top to bottom. And it works really well for me. And there's a lot of controls. I'm not going to go through all the controls now because there's too much to see. But there's things like cropping. If I go to the crop overlay tool, this allows me to do all sorts of things. I can keep the 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 resolution. I can keep the uh, the ratio locked or unlocked. So I'll lock this, and I'll change that ratio. And if I want this slide that was smaller and zoom in a little bit, I can do that. If I want to change the ratio so that it's not locked anymore, I can then change it whatever I want it to be and do that. So I've now got everything else. That's the photograph, which if I exported it by going onto the library and export, this is how I export the, the, the raw files to usable JPEGs. So if I was wanting to put something up online or something, I can save it there. That's for a different day, but basically... Let's go back to what it was again. And how are you undoing? Are you doing I'm just doing a control, control Z? Z. The same, control Z, the same as you would in any any normal sort of. Um, I think what what we do Windows need program. to be aware of is that we're assuming this is a, an absolute beginner's photography course. Now I do audio editing, so I do know that Control Z. That's and a normal does. Windows type control, yeah. It's okay. Control Z is a normal undo in almost all Windows programs. Okay. 
what I can also do on this, so if I've got something, one of my pet hates is, as we discussed on the last one, is one of my photographs where it's not horizontal. Well, we can change the angle. But also there's a lovely little auto button, which again, is, if I click the auto, it does its best guess to get it horizontal. And also it'll crop it in to make it right. So I'll undo the auto straightens with a control Z again. So that is the crop tool. We then have another tool, which you're going to come back to shortly, but this is the, the, um, the, the, the spot correction tool. I'll come back to that okay. shortly. As a red eye correction, if you have red eye on, on people's photographs, you know where you get that red eye when you've got a flash, which what that's caused to is the light bounces off the back of the eye and it actually causes the blood vessels to, sh to shine bright red. Oh, didn't know that. We have a graduated filter. Now, these are the things used to get these filters, which used to slide down in front of the lens to make a nice sort of a sunburst effect on this. Uh, again, I'm not going to take too much on here, but what I can do is I can draw that down and I can... So the top half is darkened. The I'm not sure how you did that. Isn't. I think I may have missed I literally how just, you did it. I literally just put a, a dot at the top. I'll take that off again. So where I'll are you click clicking on, on the right click hand on there, side? Graduate right, the filter. Okay, yep. Went to the center at the top and I just pulled down. And you can see three lines, one at the very top, one at the bottom and one in the middle. And basically everything above the top is altered, so I can change it to. Uh, That's nice because it looks down. like it's got a much more um, dramatic sky. Yeah. Now. Or if it's too dark, you can lighten it up. Or I can even change the hue of that sky. And so basically, it's it's graduated above that line is whatever the effect is, and below that line isn't. But it's a nice gradual change. Mm. And again, if I wanted to, I can do all sorts, but bring in the exposure. Or if you've got some nice clouds, you can play around on that with things like the texture and the clarity. So you can really boost the clarity. You can see the no clouds. It's a clouds there, a bit of texture in there. So you're getting a little bit of cloud coming up where previously maybe you wouldn't have. You can play around with the dehaze. And it's only going to affect above that line. So now, if we go back to the original photograph, click done. We have a very different photograph. Wow, look at that. Well, that information is all on the left-hand side. It's just hidden. Gosh, it looks so, so much better with the blue in the sky. It's amazing what you can do. And you could even change it to a red sky if you wanted to. And then, you know, you can start putting colour change on it. Let's flick through a bit further there's one of your garden totally on the left hand side things. you can't see anything you've suddenly got detail again all i think i did on that was hit the auto most of that was done by the thing a little bit of clarity under it nice not much detail suddenly by bringing up the again the clarity on this one Oh, wow. You can suddenly see that it, it has more effect, that it seems to stand out more yeah. because of that. And again, these it doesn't necessarily have to be huge changes. Sometimes it's a very subtle change will make a photograph just have that little bit of zing. And trying to work out what the zing is is sometimes difficult, but it just works. And again, if you're going to put this to somebody else... The image on the right hand side does that a little bit more oh, that's, yeah, as opposed to... Well, well, your eye is very much drawn to the, the cone. Yeah. Now, and it wasn't before, it was all, and yet you'd think it would be because it feels, everything feels a bit more clear on the right-hand side. It does, and that's because that's clarity strange. coming in because it makes it a little bit more defined. Again, a totally un unusable photograph on the left-hand side. If that was, if you had a particular memory, I mean, it's not maybe the best memory of a, a muddy bridge, but if that was something you want to particularly capture, it's underexposed. Uh, but how do you get that back? Well, what again, what we've done, again, pretty much hitting the auto and a bit of clarity on that, but you've suddenly got an image on the right-hand side which put, which conveys something. And there was one of these images which had um, two of your family walking across it, and you couldn't actually see they were there hardly. 
well, by the time you'd finished with this, you could see them. And mm. if, if this was going into some sort of storybook of how you'd done a, um, a, a Sunday afternoon walk, this is part of the story. Little only granddaughter. Again, this is where memories come in. It's maybe if we're looking at that, it's it's a bit out of focus, it's a bit soft, but that's not the point. We're trying to get a memory across, but she's somewhat missing into the background there. Mm. Uh, again, hit the literally I hit the auto button. I haven't done anything to this except hit the auto button and let Lightroom do something. But now we have something which can use as a memory. And this is what the whole point for me is. Lightroom is wonderful for just that quick manipulation. Um, it doesn't have the full tool set of Photoshop, but do you need it? So I know you showed me a few months ago, you were sort of whitening the eyes and um, whitening the teeth. Is that a Photoshop tool rather than a... No, we can do it in this one. Let's, let's, I think there's, um, there's a couple that I've got there. Right, these are the same. These are exactly the same photographs. So let's take this as an idea on this one. You can see that all these sliders are in a line. It hasn't done anything to the image at all whatsoever. And, you know, it's a great for, straightforward image. Let's hit, let's see what happens when we hit auto. Quite a bit of movement on the sliders, but it's fairly subtle on there. But again, it just has a little bit extra pop. Yes. Now, let's... Can you give her okay. a, a missing tooth? Um, not easily no. on this one. <laughs> not easily on this one. But what we can do is we can say, okay, then let's put a little bit of lightning on this tooth. Let's go to the adjustment brush. And if we hit new, double click on effect, and that brings everything back into line. And what we have on here, on the adjustment brush on this, we have some custom adjustments, and there's one marked teeth whitening. And what it does is it puts, if I just, I'm guessing you have to be a little bit careful with this, not to make it look Well, the good artificial. thing is you can see there's a little bit of the, the, the line on the tooth there, which it keeps intact. But if I zoom out on that, to me, that's a little bit too bright. It is, yeah, a bit bright. That's okay. What we can do is we can zoom into that again. If I click on there, we can see what it's done. It's a little bit too much exposure onto that. So we can bring the exposure down somewhat. And you see, it's only affecting the teeth. Oh, yeah. It's only affecting the, the part that we did. So what we can do is we can bring it down just a touch. So it's got the tiniest little amount on there. The problem with the, with the youngster, with the child, is the teeth are fairly much the right colour you'd want them yes. to be in the first place. They haven't yeah. had that de decaf. The, the, the black coffee and the red the wine. The black coffee bit, yeah. But, but that does work. That looks better. Yeah. And what we've been able to do is just adjust it somewhat. Um, and again, with a, with a child, it's difficult because skin softening, they've, they've got beautiful skin. soft skin. Mm. But there is another one on there if we go down to this. Again, I just click onto the, this is the adjustment brush. If we go onto the custom, in fact, I'll go to new. How did you get to custom? Just, you go a little bit quick for me. Okay. I'm going to go to new because I, I want the second effect. I don't want to affect that first one. So if I go where it's got teeth whitening, that's a custom one. Iris and hand. Iris Enhanced, Skin Softening. Let's go to Iris Enhanced because this is always quite a good one to do. And again, this just brings just a, a slight. I thought they were going to go bright red. No. The red shows you where you've been, where you've been actually doing it. But again, it's a subtle one. And sometimes the subtlety is what you do need. It you know, just lifts her eyes a little bit, doesn't it? Does. It does. And this is, this is great. They're, these are wonderful little tools. Um, again, when I was doing some of the school photographs, unfortunately, some youngsters have some difficult problems with, say, acne and things. And there's a, there's a diff difficult thing on, on taking photographs of people, which I find 
you don't want to take away with something which is a natural feature. If somebody has a birthmark on their face, or, um, a beauty spot or something like that, you don't want to take that away. But do you necessarily want the, the spot which has appeared on someone's face still there um, 20 years' time when they look back? And they've got that little that little skin spot or a bit of acne on their on their face, which is going to be reminiscent for the rest of the life. Um, let's go back to this one, for instance. No, it's... there we are. There's a little bit of a spot on there. What I've done on this one is I've just taken that skin spot off. Oh wow! So if I go to here, this one is a spot removal tool let's click on there and what i've done on this let's delete that you see that she's got a little spot on there that isn't part of her makeup as such as a person this is something which is transient in life it's you know it's not what she wants to be necessarily seen in 20 years time if she was looking at this photograph um if it was a, a beauty mark if it was a, something which is pertinent to her for instance, I have a, a lump on the side of my nose, which has now become sort of synonymous with me. I wouldn't want that taken away. It's part of me. But if I just go over the top of that and click. Now, what I've got this on is on heel. Can I have a clone or heel? And what heel does on this, I can change the size of this. And you want it to be fairly tight in. And again, you can feather it and, and get it to go around there. But if I just click on there, it goes and finds the closest piece of skin possible to it as course this piece of image possible and tries to match it up instant Gosh. spot removal let's go back to that first photo because the first photo just unzoom that and just zooming in by clicking on the photo but if let's, let's go back to this one and this is where i find this really really useful great photograph um can you see that there's some spots on there which aren't on here oh yes well let's have a look at these ones these ones on the top just above the drain they distract the eye you can't do anything about that the, the path's there but if i zoom in onto it and i go to the spot removal tool and i can have something just a little bit bigger i can click and drag across there and that disappears and that disappears and this disappears and this disappears and that and this white spot in front of the tire and lightroom has been very clever and just getting rid of all the it's sorting out where to find it from if it doesn't get in the right place for instance if i try and get rid of this bit see how it's got a line to where it is i can move that there's some there which I think matches better. That's just, I'm holding down the space key and dragging while it's zoomed in. But again, I'll get rid of this bit. I'll get rid of these. It's quite quick, nice and easy. So if you're taking little spots off someone's face, Okay, let's hit done on that and we'll zoom out again. Look what's happened up there. Yeah. So that's a wonderful little tool. This is all in... in Can't take a drain bubble. cover out though. Um, you can, but it takes a lot more doing that. Usually a Photoshop sort of thing, because Photoshop does these so much better uh, about that. But that's a big thing to do on that. So my point is on here, we've got the ability on all of these to actually... There's another one I haven't done. Um, We've got the ability to save photographs or to bring things out. Let's hit auto on that one. It hasn't done a great deal. We've still got lots of shadow. Let's take the shadows up ourselves manually. Let's take the exposure up slightly. Maybe not an ideal, that, but it's... No, but that does feel like a better photograph now. It does. And let's just try and strain it up just a touch. That took me 10 seconds and we've now got a usable shot, maybe not ideal, but a usable shot from that. So post-production, 
it, it take, it's a skill to be learned. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. This isn't a Lightroom course by any means. And you'll also find there's an awful lot of these things which you can do in the free software which comes with your camera. So you don't necessarily need to take out a Lightroom subscription. Uh, is me, the functionality I'm, and the, the terminology going to be pretty similar? Pretty much. Um, this idea of a histogram, you, you've got a histogram on the back of your camera if you want to be able to use it. This idea of a histogram um, is pretty much standard across. Colour temperature, it's the, the temperature is measured in degrees Kelvin. Um, because Kelvin is an absolute from minus 273 degrees, which is absolute zero all the way up. And we measure light in a temperature scale. And the higher the colour, we get more towards ultraviolet, up towards the blue scale. As we go down and we get the warmer, we go to more towards the infrared scale. And normally on daylight, you're sitting around about the 5,000 degrees Kelvin. Um, if we're using things like um, tungsten light, which is inside our, our sitting rooms, most of the old um, normal lights, they tend to be very orange and they tend to be around about the three, 3,500 degrees. And again, by changing that color temperature, changes what we have on there. And that's the adjustment. Although it's going down in figures, we're saying if this was at 3000 degrees, if, if we set the color temperature to 3000 degrees, well, actually the light there was incredibly blue. It was incredibly right, white. So it's, it's, it's wrong for this. We're up towards the high side of the scale, 40,000 Kelvin. And we're, getting, we're up the infrared, but in actual fact, our light was very orange. It was, it was a much lesser temperature. And again, by clicking on the little white balance selector, if we can find something which we think is white on there, it's yeah. done for us. And it yeah. tells us it's about 6,350 degrees Kelvin to get that white, white. So we've got lots of tools we can do. Of course, what is white? The white on these lines is different. The white on the doors is different to the windows. So, you know, you get a little bit of messing about. Tint is the same. Exposure is a straightforward uh, term. So is contrast. Highlights. Well, again, I said about starting at the top and go at the bottom. Highlights are the extreme right-hand side. And you can see, if you look on the building here, we talk about highlights being blown out when we're taking photographs. People can see, oh, the highlights are blown out. Well, if we slide the highlights up, can you see how we've got no detail on that part mm -hmm. now? It's so bright, we've got no detail. And if you look at this histogram up the right-hand side, it's off the scale. It's like, it's like turning up the volume of, of the, the light intensity and you can't take it up anymore, it's clipping. So by bringing the highlights down allows us to have the latitude on that. We can play around with there. Just take it back up a second. Interestingly, when you've brought it down, we can, you can now see cables. Mm. When you take it down, the, it, they're actually not, telegraph the sky cables. isn't being blown out. And again, remember what I said about the detail. Whoops, that's exposure, I beg your pardon. If you double click on any of these, it takes it back to what it originally was. So let's hit auto on that because that's what we've, we've done. So by blowing the highlights out, you're blowing the detail out. You're losing detail on that. And you can't easily get it back. If this has been, if this has been blown out by being overexposed in the first place, you can't get this back. That's the problem. So that's why we try and shoot within a range. The other thing you can do is if I hold down the Alt key and keep it held down while I move this, you'll be able to see as I slide it across. In fact, no, it's not. Where are we? Ah, there we are. We can see when, uh, when something starts to peak. Now, this is the white. I've got the Alt key held down, and we can see by sliding across the white, when the white first come in, I leave go of it. Our whites are probably about right. Bring our highlights down, and we've probably got our whites about right. Again, with the blacks, if I press the Alt key and hold the blacks, this is at the bottom of the scale. And if you look to the histogram, we're moving it left and right at the bottom, at the, the, the dark end. And by taking it fully white and then just pulling it back in so we see the first little bit of detail. I don't think I followed that, Brian. I'm sorry. 
Oh, can you see at the bottom there? There's some little bits of yellow coming in. Yeah. That's where we're starting to get the blacks being shown. So what we're doing is by holding the alt key down, we're basically overdoing everything and we're saying, this is where we're starting to see the blacks. Now, all of this, if you look at that histogram up the top, top right, it's off the end of the scale. And are you moving so your mouse or something? So I'm you've moving got my the... mouse and you can see the black slider moving. So as I move ah, it to the right, right okay. you can see the histogram just coming off the black. So I'm not overloading the black. I've just got it there. So my blacks are probably about right. If you do too much black, you see, you start losing the detail there. In the same way as you blow out the, the white, you can blow out the blacks. So by holding this and getting it so you can just there, got my blacks right. And again, the whites, we're we'll putting it in total blackness. And if you look at the histogram up the top, if I move this to the right-hand side, we're going to get to the point where it starts to blow the whites out and eventually we'll get to some of it coming through. So you want to get just then. What this is doing is saying, okay, then we're not blowing anything out. The little bit that you can see there is at the extreme right-hand side. So we've got as much white as we can have, as much black as we can have. If we take those sliders any further, we're just losing detail. But what we've now got is something in the middle and we can play around with the shadows and we can play around with the exposure and things. It's easy enough to do, but just play with them. Mm. But if it's pleasing, then it's pleasing. That's not pleasing. A bit more exposure. Can you use the shot? Yes, you can. The point on this is that you've got the ability now to actually redeem some of your shots to make the shots that you do have, which are good to be slightly better, to be able to crop in and be able to take it in tighter. For instance, um, this one of, is it this one? Yeah, let's have a little look on that. Now, the original of this, if I unclick that, the original of this shot looked like that. Pleasing enough, but if we now slide it in a little bit and say, okay, let's keep the same aspect ratio, but slide it in. And if we take it, oh, where am I? If we take it right in, we can get it in the same aspect ratio as that. Let's move her a little bit. So now, She's the center point of the frame. If we hit auto on that one, a face is a little bit overexposed. So I would actually suggest maybe that, although this is quite nice, the face is a little bit ex overexposed. I maybe bring down the whites somewhat, put a little bit of clarity onto it. But basically what you have compared to the original, it is cropped in now, but also a bit more usable image. Isn't it the strangest thing? So, I mean, she's smiling in both, but she looks happier. On the right. On the right. Yeah. So this is a really useful thing to get, to get into. As I say, you can do cataloging things. This isn't meant as a big Lightroom tuition course. Um, if you want to watch it, there's a huge amount on, on Facebook. I'm going to stop sharing this now, actually. There's a huge amount on Facebook, oh, sorry, Facebook, on YouTube, of people who are doing far better instruction um, videos on Lightroom than, than I ever could. But the point is that by using some post-production software, we're now able to utilize what we've seen. So if you can imagine something like that photograph that you had of the bridge, which you said was really the best one, had that huge amount of green on the left-hand side. If you'd cropped it in, there's nothing that says that you have to have a, a, a four by three aspect ratio image. In fact, if you're posting on Instagram, Instagram used to be restricted to square images. So you could actually change that aspect ratio to crop it to better. If you find that the whole thing's too far down in the photograph to get that idea of the, 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 the two thirds, the, the, the third, one third, two thirds split, just chop some of it off you lose some of the resolution. 
but with a, a sensor, your sensor is about 16 megapixels. Um, you know, the, you've got an awful lot that you can use on that photograph before you start getting it too much of a pixelated image. You can really start digitally zooming in. That's what digital zooming in is doing. But you can, on that photograph that you took, for instance, you could say, well, actually, can I lose some of that green? It might be worth having a little bit on there, but if I was to bring the whole thing in slightly and crop it in, does that then make it better because you've got the real shot that you wanted with the water under the bridge, but less of the green that you had previously? And then you can also say, well, actually, it's a little bit too dominant a colour in there. Can I just change the exposure of just that green? Just a little bit down. Don't want it to look odd, but a little bit of less exposure doesn't mean to say that it, it's not quite so drawing on the eye. Mm. Um, if you're taking a photograph of somebody you know, as we said earlier on, somebody who's a little bit older and they've got the coffee stained teeth and things, then you can just put that little bit of a sparkle on there. Again, be careful. The, the over whitened teeth look yeah, silly. You don't want to look like a Colgate uh, advert. Absolutely. Sorry, other toothpastes uh, are available. But I, and to tell you the truth, sometimes the subtlety is well worth it. Um, I had a, I took a photograph. I used to take a, a, a lot of photographs of school pupils, for instance. I did school photography for quite a while. And also I used to do military cadets. Um, you've got these youngsters in, the, in the, the uniform. Unfortunately, teenagers are the ideal age for having acne and having the, the, the skin problems that they, do, that they do get in that sort of mid-teens bit. And, uh, you know, you, you, you tend to get some youngster who's, who's got that issue you don't want them, if you want to sell the shots especially, you don't want them picking up on, the, on the, the acne. But if you remove too much of it and you make the skin too artificially soft and it doesn't look real. So sometimes it's just that little bit of taking some of the, the marks away, but leaving some of it because, again, um, you get some youngsters who have some quite severe skin problems, but that becomes them. That becomes part of their, their personality. Mm -hmm. And that's how their parents see them you've got to get that, that balance between the two. And what I used to do an awful lot of those, I used to put a, a subtle amount of, uh, of, of teeth whitening, but very, very little. I used to do a certain amount of iris enhancement because the, eye, the eyes are the, the heart of the soul. The eyes are what you look at in most photographs. You, you, you usually focus on the closest eye and that's the first thing you see. So if you've got something like we discussed before, that little bit of a zing on the eye, not too much because our eyes, you know, we don't have laser beams coming from our eyes. But that little bit of, of sparkling on the eyes, that little bit of extra colour coming out can just make the difference between a photograph which sells and which doesn't for me. Mm. And again, that little bit where you've taken some of the, the acne off. And I had a parent um, a good few years ago from a, a kid that had photographed on the squadron I was on um, who asked to see the original because I'd said that it had been altered slightly. And again, because they'd seen that there was a spot there and when they saw the, the print, it didn't have the spot on. I said, oh, yeah, I've got the spot off. And I said, yes, can I see the original? And reluctantly, because I don't like showing the originals very often, I said, yes. And there was a look of shock and horror on the face because I'd actually taken a lot of skin blemishes and skin defects off, not just the spot, but that the youngest had a certain amount of acne. And of course, as a parent, you don't look at that every day or you look at it every day, but you don't notice it. But if, when it's immortalized on a, on a picture and it was a sort of gasp of breath and, I didn't realise that she had that many, that, that she had that on her face. And because it had been subtly taken off, there were still some marks and it was right. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, it does. So yeah. When you're doing yeah. things like these post-production, and this is where maybe this idea of what's right and wrong and what's cheating and not comes into it. Is it cheating removing um, a, a cold sore from someone's face where for the, for the rest of the, the time, you know, this is the photograph which gran and granddad are going to get to remember them by i think that's yeah it is yeah cheap. i like the idea of it if it's if it's a transient change you can get rid of it if it's a yeah. permanent feature absolutely i, I, I think i told you, you the story that. didn't i a little while ago about um a friend and i'm going back probably 25 30 years who had quite a large strawberry birthmark on her face and she paid a fortune on her wedding day having a makeup artist come and take it out and she looked at her, she sort of sh turned around to show her in the mirror and she went it's not me not and me. she washed off all the makeup and had it done again with the the strawberry birthmark showing through and I get you know if it had been 
if it had been a cold soul, yeah, she's not going to want that on her wedding day. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask a quick um, question about Lightroom versus Photoshop? So, you know, sometimes you see these gorgeous um, photographs that obviously, obviously are enhanced, where what comes to mind? I think it was the movie Schindler's List where you had the, the little girl with she have a red beret and the rest of it was in black and white. Yeah. Um, can you do that in Lightroom? So to get rid of the, the, the I'm, lo I'm looking at the, the bright blue tractor that I took. I'm just going to screen share again. Let's take this one. It's, it's a great photograph. Let's take this leaf. Let us, um, how am I going to do this one? I'm going to take the, the whole of the saturation down to zero on this photograph. So it's now in black and white. And I'm going to go on to that one. And I'm going to take this little thing. Let's, before I do this, let's zoom in. Makes it easier. Let's go to the brush. brush and let's put the saturation Am I doing this the wrong way? I'm doing this the wrong way. That's just bear with me. Sorry, I, I've kind of asked you this straight away, haven't I, without giving you any warning. Yeah, that's okay. Um let's do it. I'm trying to think of the quick way to do it. You know how when something comes into your mind and you think that how how would I do this? Let's do a saturation um, on this one to zero. There is an easier way to do this, but I just. Can't think off the top of my head. The easiest way to do is something you're going to do the, the the awkward way. And we'll zoom oh. in on that. Yeah, not keen on her um, red lips. It looks a bit weird. And if we do the This is but, rough and ready, but you, gosh, get the you idea, could spend right? hours getting uh, oh, yeah. playing around with this, couldn't you? And there are people who do Photoshop and Lightroom professionally who do spend hours doing it. And that's what they do for a living. Let's see, I'm not going to do it exactly, but uh, a little bit of colour there. A bit of colour there. It gives, it, it gives the idea as to how to do it. And... I'll give you an idea. It's rough and ready, but we could even do some more on that bit if we want to and get rid of there. So we're taking all the colour out apart from that leaf. Uh, yeah, that's what that was what I was thinking about. And that really didn't take long at all, did it? It didn't. I mean, it's not the best, not no. the best way of doing it. There's still an awful lot of colour there. Um, but you can see how the technique works. Mm. Um, Photoshop does do it better. It's got better tools to do this because you can actually um, create a layer in Photoshop where you can make that that leaf a layer and all the just the layer, the controls on the layer. That's for a totally different day. But Love the good thing is, I can also because it's non-destructive. Take it all back. Control Z. Let's get her back again. So yeah, you can do, you can do things Brilliant. like that on it. There is, there is so much you can do on on something like this. And again, if that leaf wasn't quite red enough, you could just make the leaf and just change the saturation on just the leaf part so that's brighter. I will never, ever, ever believe what I see ever again. 
Oh, don't. I mean, um, there's one tool which on Photoshop, which I'm not going to go into, which is called Liquify. Watch a video. Have a look on YouTube for a Liquify video. Mm. If ever you feel you feel fat or if you feel that you feel chubby, take a photograph and use Liquify. You can actually pull yourself in. And I mean, this, this, is, this is how I do it. I'm not actually as fat as I am. I use, I use a, a, a Liquify on this just to make my stomach look bigger. Um, <laughs> that's my excuse. And I'm going to stick to it. I yeah. bet, just very quickly, just this chit chat, because I know we're coming to the end, but I was listening to something the other day about deep fake, you know, the whole, um, the voice, it, it's effectively doing what you're doing with pictures, but to the voice where you can change the voice and, uh, and sync it all up. So I think the, the famous one is Tom Cruise, I think, isn't it? That is really scary. There's a, there's a few. There's one of um, President Nixon, Richard Nixon, which I've seen. And basically, the, I can't remember the actual story, but it's probably not for this video anyway, but the, the message which is conveyed across, and it was used as a demonstration thing, but the message which was conveyed across was something he could never have done because he's talking about technology, which... That wasn't invented, then. yeah. And you think, wow. Frightening, but, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So when you do get these magazine sort of covers and things where you've got these supermodels and people start getting a little bit self-conscious thinking, I wish I was like that. Well, they're probably not like that either. No, no. Um, Especially when it comes to things like you mentioned makeup before, you can change the whole sort of thing of, of makeup um, on on somebody's face as well, and and change the the, the looks that they have uh, for the better and the worse. You know, all these things can all these things aren't necessarily um, bad things. They can really be used to enhance. Um, and as we said about the idea of of the makeup for the for the bride, whether it's used for a good or a bad purpose is pretty much in the hands of the person who's wanting it done um i mean that uh, this thing about uh, wedding photographs and the spot removal tool if you've got some a bride who's having a, a beautiful photograph taken a portrait photograph taken you've got pressure on the day can you imagine if there was a big clump of confetti which had been thrown but just sitting on the wedding dress which you, you know in the pressure of the day you hadn't noticed it but just ruins that photograph this is a great way to be able to, to get that out and be able to make it so that the, the memory for that person is going to stick with them forever. And it's going to be a really nice photograph on that. Um, or again, if somebody, if somebody's just, if there is makeup or something and it's just smudged or something, that's something which would bug someone for years. Yeah. Just take it away yeah. very gentle. So, and it's not that big thing. It's not a big um, change of the person, but it's a big change in the memory. It's not deep fake. It's not deep fake. But so do I have that. homework? Do you have homework? Yes. I would like you to pick a couple of photographs and do what we've just done there. I want you to take some photo to have a look at some of your non-keepers, the photographs which you're thinking, mm, if only. And I would like you to actually do them because, as I say, it's simple. You just do the changes in Lightroom. Don't go too technical. You don't need to be too clever on it. Just get something which wasn't a keeper, which suddenly becomes a keeper, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll have to go and learn how to use this or have some offline time with you, I think, to get my head around the actual software. Play um, with it. Play with it yeah, as easy as Yeah, I totally get that we're not going into Lightroom in particular because people might be using lots of different ones. I think there's yeah. a, a free open source software, I think, called GIMP, which is a very unfortunate name, um, <laughs> which is apparently very, very good and it's free and it's open source. So There are a lot of software. And this is, again, why I'm not doing a Lightroom course, because there are so many on this. There, There's a lot of the free software which comes with the, with the cameras themselves, which do... A perfectly ample job for, for doing something like this. You know, there's so many of the paint programs. Um, but to be honest, just play with what, you, what you're what mm -hmm. you doing. Um, the, you're not going to go too wrong, especially if it's a non-destructive um, one. The only thing I would say on this, though, have a look on the library thing for on the library side of Lightroom like, insofar as how to export. Because when you export the photos, that takes it from being the raw and it applies all the change you've just done and creates a JPEG that you can then use. use. And then you can put up your social media, you can put in your wedding albums, you can do anything you like on that. Silly question, but if you were sending, say, say you, got, you took a photograph that you thought, oh my God, that is stunning. I want that on a canvas on the wall. Would you send the printer the raw or the JPEG? 
always a JPEG because the JPEG, the RAW has the information there, but the RAW is pretty unusable insofar as that. The RAW is what you, the RAW is what you have. And again, I'll quickly share my screen on this. Oh, hang on a minute. I'm being a bit dumb here. So all of the enhancements that you've just done, so you couldn't export the one on the right as I, a RAW. Not as a it RAW. It would have to be a PNG or a JPEG or something. Yeah. Gotcha. So if I take gotcha, that, gotcha. if I go to the library and I take that particular photo, highlight it, and I hit export, I can then tell it where I want to put it. I can do all sorts of, there are some presets for it and some user presets, but basically I can tell it which folder I want to put it into. I can rename it if I want to, and this will do it on batch. So if I have a whole load highlighted, it'll do them on batch. Um, Does it only export to JPEG? You can get the JPEG, TIFF, PSD, oh, PNG. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can limit the file size. So if you're uploading the say, um to, to something like um, Facebook. Facebook normally is about 2,000 pixels wide. So I can change the file size so it's not huge, but I can also resize it to say it's that, longer This is really quite important, actually, if anybody's wanting to use them on their website because you want to keep the website yep. images I as tend to keep as, mine yeah. to about the long edge to 1,900 pixels. Change the resolution, I don't worry about that. You can sharpen it for screen or for different types of paper. So if you're printing it out on a printer at home, you can change it there. Um, the metadata, which is the information which is held in there, the EXIF data, you can get it so that it's removed. So if you've got person-specific information in there, or you can change any location, you can remove location. I can put a watermark on. And if I put the watermark on, I have various watermarks I've done, and you can edit the watermarks. Mine will put Brian James 2021 at the bottom, for instance. And that's on that's superimposed on the photograph. Um, and again, you, after it's done, you can get it to open a window and show an explorer. So if I hit export on this, I've got show an explorer. You can see at the top left, I've got exporting one file. And in a moment, on my screen, it should hopefully, you won't be able to see this, so I'll stop sharing. I'll, sh I'll bring up my um, desktop. The whole load of other photos in there. But hopefully there, there's some other photos I took. But there is the JPEG with the original name. In fact, that won't show because I've double This isn't it. held. This is no longer in a file in Lightroom. This is now in a file. This is on now your... a JPEG. And if you notice on that JPEG, in fact, what I'll do is I'll open that up. I'll stop sharing again and I'll share just that JPEG picture. So this is, can you see the picture now? Yep. So there you can see it's the one which is the post production. It's got all the changes done on it. Um, it's a JPEG. If I right click on this one and give the file information, we can see that it's 1990 on the long edge, which is what I asked it to be. It's got my, I've, I kept the EXIF information in it. It was done on a, an EM10 Mark II, which is your camera. Um, it tells me where it is, it tells me the date it was taken, 17th of January. So that's all that's still in the photographs. So I didn't tell it to take it out, but it is now the post-production version of that photo. And if I wanted to, I could put this on the Facebook or Instagram, anything I wanted to. I can send it to your sister and I'll give it to your niece. Well, I can send it to my sister and as you say, give it to niece. In fact, let's stop this screen share and we can do that straight after this. Brilliant. How, how's that? Has that been useful? It has, yeah. It feels like um, it, it feels like a little bit of a black pit that I could end up getting into that could steal my time away um, because I, I can imagine getting in there and with, a, I, I mean, I've got 164 photographs in this latest album and I can see myself spending hours um, playing around so no it's good I think well, I'm um, going to ask you a question on this if I can as well we've been doing this since January since you got the, the, the camera at Christmas and we've covered the technical aspects we've covered uh, and the idea was not to be too techy so we've, we've covered the technical aspects from a using point of view we've, we've covered aperture and, and shutter speed and the ISO we've covered depth of field and we've covered um, um, some of the 
the compositional rules. We've now got into the idea of some of the post-production. To be honest, I don't think there's a great deal more to teach. I think there's, what we've covered is pretty much there. And I think that the learning, because there's a difference between teaching somebody and, and, and them learning. I think the learning is, is pretty much under you now. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that we've now got to the point where you can go into the world confident that you can expand on your own photography? Or do you need this to carry on? I think I'm at that point where I don't know what I don't know that I need to know yet. So I've got, I, I've got the foundations and I've got enough to go and start playing around and I'm not going to know what the next step is until I come up against the, and, until I get to the point where I go, I, I really want to get this shot and I don't know how to do it. Well, can I make a suggestion? Because I, what we discussed about the idea of taking some of your non-keepers and keepers is a great way to, to progress. But I think that's pretty much taken us from the beginning where, because if you remember on that first lesson, on that first thing, the beginning was where to find the switch to switch the camera on. Yeah. I think it's a, we've done quite a journey from there. I think the idea that you can get to a photograph which you're happy to keep is probably the end point insofar as this. The rest of it is how you then progress yourself and, and the inspiration you take from various places. So I'm going to suggest that maybe the next time we do this is the time we, we wrap this up and, and, and do a summation, have a look at what you've what you've done insofar as how you get those keepers, but also maybe do um, a recap on the whole lot next time. How does that sound to you? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. I think that's great. And, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really... Um, I'm really quite envious of the fact that you've taken this journey. It took me a, a long time going through some of these things and the technology wasn't there. I think what we've got in the way of technology, just be able to talk these, these things through between us is, is fabulous. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a real, it's, it's quite a, um, it's, 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 it's quite a, a, a furtive sort of ground that we have insofar as technology on the internet and on YouTube to be able to, um, to, to, to be able to further ourselves in this. So it's great. So if it's okay with you, that's what we'll aim for next time. Yeah, and that'll round it up with an, a nice eight, 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 eight episode series, perfect. won't it? Which will be perfect. Well, until that, um, once again, for all of you watching, if you get the chance to subscribe and to hit the little bell to get notifications when we send that video out, then that's great. But uh, until then, if you're taking photographs at home, Enjoy the photographs that you take from Bev. Well, I'm going to say goodbye, but I want to say just one thing apart from saying thank you. Obviously, um, I would expect nothing less from my brother, of course, of course, than to give up all of your time to teach me something that's taken you a lifetime to learn. But what I was going to say was the, the these um, videos of you helping me to learn how to, to take photographs are great for absolute beginners. But I would really urge anybody who's come across this video uh, without knowing the rest of your work to go and explore some of the other videos in your playlist, especially the things around some of the history stuff that you're doing around the northwest of England and some of the, the tutorials that you're doing in terms of equipment. The, the videos are superb. I'm really loving them. Oh, uh, you. And it's, you know, so they're very different to this this series um you, you're, you're actually showing off your skills instead of critiquing mine um and I, yeah i would just urge people to go and have a look around and see some of the other work that you've done because it's really good oh, that's great thank you very much thanks for saying that and um the from there i think we'll leave it till the next time Brilliant. all the best everybody thanks, thanks for very watching. much bye bye